Čanakale. Pročitajte zašto su Čanakale najsvjetlija stranica sanđačkog naroda. Saznajte zašto je ovo jedna od najznačajnijih knjiga moderne turske književnosti i zašto je svaka naša kuća treba imati. Duboko emotivna knjiga koja je mnoge oči rasplakala i mnoga srca dotakla. Čanakale. Priča o odbrani Istambula u prvom svjetskom ratu, kada je učešće uzelo i 12.000 džurumlija sa ovih prostora. Da li je Allah zbog njih sačuvao Sanđak, saznajte kroz fenomenalnu knjigu Čanakale. Sira Prva knjiga o životopisu najvećeg i najznačajnijeg među sinovima Ademovim Muhammeda sallallahu alaihi wa sallam pisana rukom i srcem bošnjaka Hafiza doktora Safveta Halilevića Knjiga koja će nas približiti Allahovom miljeniku i otvoriti srca za suzu koja će pasti zbog žrtve koju ovaj čovjek podnese da bi se mi danas muslimanima zvali. Pročitajte zašto je Muhammed a.s. najveći humanista i borac za ljudska prava koji je zemljom hodio knjizi Sira, životopis posljednjeg Allahovog poslanika. Allahumma salli ala sejidina Muhammed Immediately, most of the custom officers, eight or ten, gathered together and they started asking, Sir, can we ask you one more question? <laughs> so I just told my host on the mobile that, please don't worry, I'm stuck up here, I'm just doing dawa. <laughs> I keep on traveling, mashallah. I've been to Australia, to UK several times. By God's grace, time I did spend, not more than a couple of hours. I know many of my colleagues were detained. Many of my colleagues means my speakers, I'm not talking about my Bombay speakers, I'm talking about the international speakers who keep on traveling. They have been detained, they have been deported. Allah's grace that so far I have not been detained, I have been deported. Maximum half an hour at Dawa and I see to it that whenever I get opportunity, I grab it. But I see to it that I quote the scriptures. I follow the guidance of the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Ta'ala vila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to come in terms as in us and you. So when we come to come in terms, most of the problems are solved. This talk, what we're having today, was supposed to be held more than a month back. I was supposed to be in London. That's why this talk is delayed. And when I landed on the 10th of August, on Heathrow Airport, and I received a call from my wife. Fakir, where are you? I said, why? No, why are you in the airport outside? What happened? I said, no, we just received information that there are some 21 Muslims arrested who are supposed to bomb blast, etc, etc. But Alhamdulillah, I had my own camera crew with me. We were 12 of us. All of them, cap, beard, God's grace, we passed through very well. I had my talk in Birmingham. It was successful. Next day, sometimes we go and do shooting. So next day, we went to one of the Jewish graveyards and we were shooting. Shooting, not shooting, we were recording. <laughs> You know, we in our lingo, we say shooting means recording on the video camera. Just to get talk shot of the city. And we spent a couple of hours in the Jewish graveyard. Later on, we went to one of the church, did the recording shooting. Then we went for breakfast and we came back to the hotel in the afternoon. Then we get information. The police of Birmingham, they're trying to track us down. Maybe some passerby went and complained. They were looking for seven or eight terrorists with cap and beard. Who are these people? They had the number, plate. And they knew it was a green car. So what they did, they phoned the insurance company and they tried to find out where we were. And finally they located us in the hotel. But luckily, while doing inquiry, they even happened to speak with the person who I had breakfast with. And he happened to be a very famous politician, Muslim politician. So when the chief of that area, of the police station, spoke to him, that you were looking for these terrorists. He said, what nonsense they're talking. Do you know, two months back, I had given a DVD of a person by the name of Dr. Zakir Naik. He said, yes, he's the same person. Oh, same person. Problem solved. The passerbys who had reported, you know, beard is dangerous. Beard, cap, dangerous. 
you have to be careful but again God's help Allah's help and I am safely back here otherwise I wouldn't have been here to give the talk the Muslims should not be afraid we should speak the truth but with hikmah you have to be careful Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 125 Udu wal muazit al hasna ahsan invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious when we speak you have to speak with hikmah now we realize after seeing the scenario that who has the monopoly on terrorism and according to me terrorism is a monopoly of the politicians <laughs> according to my understanding and survey terrorism is a monopoly of the politicians irrespective they may be politicians of USA of UK or India it is the monopoly of the politicians we have to realize what is the cause of terrorism if we want to abolish terrorism first we have to understand the root cause I being a doctor we don't believe in symptomatic treatment we believe in trying and finding out what is the cause and killing the germ that's a better treatment what is the cause of terrorism the experts say that the cause of terrorism is injustice when injustice is done on a particular group of people when wrong is done on a particular group of people they tend to retaliate and that is the only cause of terrorism and when we realize that whether it be the 9-11 the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York whether it be the 7th July the bombing in London or the serial bomb blast 93 in Bombay or the recent bomb blast on 11th of July whether it be the thousands of people killed in Afghanistan in Iraq in Gujarat in Bosnia whether it be in Palestine in Lebanon we find that behind them the main cause are the politicians I was wondering that when I landed in UK that why were 21 young Muslims arrested the government said we were keeping track on them for several months many people I met who knew these people were arrested personally they said impossible they can't be involved what we realize that the people wait when should this news come out at that time Israel was attacking Lebanon thousands of people were killed the Britishers were objecting so then you have a diversion 21 Muslims supposed to bomb the airline are arrested it's a bigger news so people forget about thousands of innocent people being killed in Lebanon <laughs> same thing in India Kargil any problem politicians talk about Kargil talk about the enemy Pakistan diversion politics whether it be in USA whether it be in UK whether it be in India the major cause are the politicians we know that our country more than 60 years back they were ruled by the Britishers and they had a policy of divide and rule more than 50 years back we got freedom from the Britishers but unfortunately they have left but they have left the policy behind and our Indian politicians they have adopted this policy of divide and rule they adopt this policy of divide and rule for the vote bank <laughs> from records we come to know that the country which has the maximum rights anywhere in the world it is India if not daily at least once a week we have communal rights this great country of us so many great religions are there maximum rights communal rights and the major cause almost all directly and indirectly they are the politicians for the vote bank for the power for the money they engineer these things otherwise normally I have met non-Muslims it's my job it's my profession I am a student of comparative religion I keep on meeting different sorts of people generally the common Indian irrespective of whether he's Hindu or a Muslim they would love to live with each other harmoniously they would love to live peacefully we may have our differences we don't want to fight but it is these politicians it is these politicians who engineer hatred among different religions so that they could fill the vote bank and you see almost all the rights that have taken place indirectly or directly they are the cause we know that few years back there was a political gimmick the Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi issue you know Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi issue in Ayodhya 
I would like to know how many of us Muslims and Hindus knew about Babri Masjid and Ram Jan Bhumi before the politicians made it a gimmick. How many of us knew? I had never heard of this Babri Masjid. And when I asked the common Hindu, he had never heard of this. Only after the politicians made it a political gimmick, people knew about it. And we know on the 6th of December 1992, they wanted to have a big procession, a gathering at this site. The Supreme Court had explicitly said that no gathering anywhere close to the disputed site. A group of politicians, they make it a political gimmick of Ram Jan Bhumi issue and the Babri Masjid issue. They want to gather on 6th of December. The ruling politicians know very well that they have the Supreme Court backing. They could have easily stopped the gathering, easily. But then they think, if I stop, I may lose vote. So they let the gathering take place. The gathering takes place and then they say spontaneously the thousands of cars were gathered there. Spontaneously the Babri Masjid was destroyed. Spontaneously. You know, there was live recording on the various satellite channels. We know that with Trishus and Lathis, how can you get down a structure? Is it possible? No. They had planted explosives with this pre-planned act that planted explosives, anyone can see. You don't have to be a specialist of military. You can see it with your eyes. The explosives were planted and that's how the structure came down. Can the structure come down with Lathis and Trishuls? Maybe George Bush saw this. 6 December 1992. That's how he had conducted the inside job of 11 September. <laughs> Time does not permit me to speak about the inside job. That requires a lecture by itself inside job of 11 September. Many Americans have spoken about that. Maybe he saw it and he got the idea that let's conduct in New York also. Later on, what happens? This emerges into riots. Throughout the country, there were riots. It is the largest riot after partition in the whole country where tens of thousands of innocent human beings were killed, mainly Muslims. Who's to blame? The innocent Indians. They are instigated by the politicians. Fight, kill the opposite religion people. Instigated, innocent people, they get instigated and they do the act. We know that even in Bombay, one of the cities that was maximum affected was Bombay. Even during partition, the riots that took place in Bombay was the worst in the history of Bombay. Even during partition, so many people were not killed as during the December 92 and January 93 riots. The police, if they wanted, they could have easily prevented the riot, very easy. With the backing of the reserve police, with the backing of the military, easily they could have done it, but they did not do it. Most of them were silent spectators. Some were good, they tried, but they were in a minority. Majority were silent spectators, some were party to it. I am aware that even the police is controlled by the politicians. So the police wants to do something, the politicians come in between. So the blame goes back to the politicians. Later on, the government appoints a single judge commission to appease the minority. And they appointed Justice Sri Krishna. It was famously called as the Sri Krishna Commission. And we know that Justice Sri Krishna, he was and is a devout and a practicing Hindu. But at the same time, he is an upright and honest judge, just like how we have Justice Suresh here. An honest and an upright judge. The verdict he gave, it did not go down the throat of the government. It takes a few years. And he had analyzed the full cases of the riot. He spoke with the politicians, with the police. Individually, he visited 26 police stations, analyzed the records, spoke with the police officer, junior and senior, spoke with the victims, spoke with the media, and after a great deal of research, he presented, we have this damning verdict of Sri Krishna Commission. He even gave suggestions how can we prevent these rights. But, you know, it takes time. By the time this happened, the government says bygones are bygones. Because they know if they implement the report, they are afraid that they will lose the vote bank. At that time, to appease the minority, they appointed the commission. How many commissions? I don't know. 
how many i don't know how many commissions have been implemented i think justice suresh can tell how many commissions that the appoint have really been implemented in india how many so here we know it is a delaying tactics the innocent indians especially the muslim victims we have faith in the judiciary system of india if the politicians betray us if our other citizen fellow members betray us if the police betrays us in this country we have yet faith in the judiciary system and we know that finally most of the innocent people whether they are arrested etc they are finally released but the damage done to them it cannot be undone later on we come to know after a couple of months on 12th of march 1993 there was a series of 13 bomb blast in bombay in which more than 250 innocent citizens of bombay were killed more than 250 innocent human beings were killed and more than 700 human beings were injured the opposition said oh planned everything just shri krishna said it was not meticulously planned it was a retaliation more than 1500 innocent muslims killed in riots in bombay more than 1500 innocent muslims during the bombay riots of december 92 and january 93 were killed it was a retaliation and the authorities and the police said it was done by muslim underworld with the help of some others that's how the bomb blast took place and they say all of them agreed even the police commissioner they agreed that it was a retaliation to what had happened in bombay we know that immediately after the riots of december 92 and january 93 it was difficult for the muslims to walk on the streets it was difficult for him to travel in the train travel in the bus to work in a non muslim area they were looked down upon they were ridiculed immediately after 12th march 93 bomb blast those scenario changes most of the muslims they know that killing innocent people is prohibited yet they had a soft corner for these people who did the bomb blast they were happy internally in islam two wrong don't make a right islam condemns this act <laughs> killing innocent human being is to be condemned you cannot kill innocent human being if somebody else has done injustice to you you can't kill a third person even if you belong to the same community islam prohibits that whoever did it whether muslim or non muslims whoever killed more than 250 innocent human beings on 12th march 1993 islam condemns it most of the muslims knew that killing innocent people is haram it is prohibited yet they were internally happy but you cannot use wrong means to reach a right goal you cannot islam does not permit that you use a wrong method to reach a right goal there cannot be any justification we realize that muslims are harassed they were tortured they were killed but you can't justify the killing of innocent human beings imagine the family of those more than 250 innocent human beings when they come to know that the muslims have killed us they will think what kind of religion is this what wrong did they do Did they harass you? The person who has harassed you, if you catch him and put him to trial and is the culprit and you punish him, no problem. All the judges give you permission. The innocent people killed on the street. What wrong did it do you? Imagine he will become a permanent enemy of Islam. Islam does not justify the killing of any innocent human being. It is to be condemned. When we realize the chain of sequence of events, who is to be blamed? we come to know that prevention is better than cure who is to be blamed when we see the sequence of events we come to know that if the opposition politicians the politician from the opposition party if they would not have used babri masjid and ram janmabhoomi issue as a political plank the bombay bomb blast in 93 would have taken place later on the politician in power they could have easily prevented the gathering they could have easily prevented the destruction of the babri masjid easily they had the supreme court verdict they had the military they had the police but they were afraid that if we do it we we'll lose vote bank so they let the destruction take place second people responsible are the politicians in power third people the innocent indians they are instigated against the minority and they involve in killing of thousands of innocent muslims they are too responsible 
but they're innocent people. Fourth people responsible is the police. The police could have easily prevented the riots in Bombay or anywhere in India, easily. We're normal civilians, we are military trained, we cannot fight with the police. It's easy, it's very easy for the police of any city, especially Bombay, to prevent the riots, very easy. Preventing terrorist attacks is difficult, I'll come to it later on. But riots is very easy, easy. But they didn't do it, some were afraid. There were a few who went out of the way and helped the innocent victims, but the majority were silent spectators. Some even were party to it. Some who were silent spectators, they were afraid that if we went against the politician, we would have been transferred. They too are to be blamed. Fourth people to be blamed are the police. Fifth, last, but not the least, the people who committed this bomb blast. Islam does not give permission to use wrong means to reach the right goal. All five categories are to be equally blamed. If you want to stop terrorist attacks, go to the root cause. Stop the injustice. Stop the wrong done to a particular group of people and terrorism will stop. <laughs> it is difficult for the police to stop the bomb blast. We know, we understand. It's not easy, it's difficult. But to stop the riots, very easy. Same case. You see most of the riots that took place in India, they have the same sequence, same people are involved, the details may differ. Same group of people are involved. We have the other example of the Gujarat massacre that started on 27th of February 2002 and went on till March 2002. It was followed after the burning of a single coach of the Sabravati Express at Godhra on the 26th of February 2002. We know very well, it is nothing hidden, it's an open secret that this train, the bogey that was burned, according to forensic reports, according to circumstantial evidence, it says that the coach was burnt from inside. There are several evidences, but everything was planned, it was pre-planned. Muslims were instigated, there was a gathering, but they didn't kill. They didn't kill the innocent people. They say that 59 car sevaks were killed, yet it is to be doubted. Yes, there may be a few people that have been killed. Many people who were thought to be killed later on were found alive. So then they kept on changing the statement. So it was an inside job. Babri Masjid inside job. 9-11 inside job. Godra inside job. Main people to blame, they are the politicians. Then immediately, next day, from 27th of February 2002, no retaliation, pre-planned. It was a state-supervised massacre of the innocent Muslims in Gujarat. Nothing spontaneous, all pre-planned. And innocent citizens of Gujarat, they were instigated. They were given money, you can see evidence, to kill thousands of innocent Muslims. According to the state of Gujarat, 793 Muslims were killed and 253 Hindus were killed. But according to several human rights organizations, they said approximately two to two and a half thousand innocent human beings were killed. Almost all of them, they were Muslims. Other report says that more than 5,000 innocent Muslims were killed. There were thousands of Muslim women who were raped. There were tens of thousands of Muslims who were asked to leave the house. The houses were looted, they were burnt. There were tens and thousands of Muslims whose places of business, they were burnt. They were completely destroyed. The people killed in Gujarat massacre is far more the number than the 9-11. The loss of the people of Gujarat, if you add it, it is much more than the loss that took place on 9-11. Yet, according to George Bush, the people who did Gujarat massacre, they aren't terrorists. Only if you harm the Americans, then there's a problem. We know that there are tons of evidence, tons of evidence in form of literature, newspaper, booklets, you have the communism combat, you have videotapes, VCDs, DVDs, actual recordings of the culprits, the people responsible yet, no action taken. Even the judiciary system, I'm sorry to say, in Gujarat failed. I think 
they were pressurized by the politicians so much so that the supreme court of india had to pass a remark against the high court of gujarat that they were biased and the trials weren't correct i feel it was mainly the politicians the supreme court of india they passed a judgment against the high court of gujarat that what verdict they gave was wrong and i feel maybe it was the politicians who have used the power and imagine what we find after a couple of months we have the akshardham temple massacre two people were caught they were killed they are said to be muslims and the authority said that these people killed so many people in the temple in revenge in retaliation and they said that all this was nothing but retaliation islam does not justify that they may have a logic these people who did the attack or the people who retaliated in other ways they have a logic they say that thousands of our family members were killed in front of eyes our mothers our sisters have been raped in front of us we have been looted we know the person responsible is our neighbor the person down the street we meet him regularly but when we see him it reminds us of the torture when they go to the law the law does not support so they take the law in the hand i am not justifying this act islam doesn't permit you they take the law in the hand and they kill other innocent human beings islam does not justify that they have a justification they say our mothers have been raped we know the culprit they in front of us no one is taking action so they take the law in the hand if you really find the culprit and book him and if he's caught if you can do that and punish him islam justifies you can't kill any other innocent human being islam does not justify that you cannot use a wrong mean to come at the right goal however much you may have sympathy for them but the point to be noted islamically it is wrong it's not justified killing innocent human being imagine the hundreds of innocent human beings killed by these people retaliation they in turn become enemies of islam what wrong have they done it is the same thing the whole your people kill innocent muslims no you kill innocent hindus it's not justified in islam if you can catch the culprit book him punish him fine but not any innocent human being later on on the 11th of july we have in this year 2006 we have a series of bomb blasts in the train seven bomb blasts in the span of 11 minutes in which more than 200 innocent human beings were killed more than 800 were injured the police and the authorities they say this too was in retaliation to the thousands of muslims killed in gujarat the authorities say it is the hand of the let lashkar e toiba if you look at the sequence of events could this have been prevented easily who is responsible number 1 those politicians who had planned the burning of the coach in the sabarwani express at godra they are responsible number 2 the people at the center at the center government they could have stopped it but they belong to the same party they don't know anything number 3 the innocent citizens of gujarat they were instigated against the muslims and they fell in the trap they too are responsible number 4 the police of gujarat could have easily prevented they didn't do it they are responsible and we know from records that most of the places it was done under the supervision of the police if you see the commission report they too are responsible number 5 the judiciary system of gujarat they didn't take action number 6 the people who retaliated in the wrong way the people who did the bomb blast islam does not justify that they too are equally responsible all six categories of people are responsible but if we can prevent the first category the first few categories surely you will not have these terrorist attacks <laughs> and we know that in the past one month thousands of muslims have been harassed mainly by the police the police says it is mainly the muslims who have done it it is the hand of the let lashkar e taiba i say if you can really identify them catch the people who are involved we have no objection but you can't harass thousands of innocent muslims hundreds of them were rounded up 
Hundreds of Muslims, they were detained for days and weeks together. As Justice Suraj said, that hundreds of them, they had been rounded up, even their family was not informed. Imagine. And the thousands of innocent family members, they too have been harassed. We know about 22 to 25 so far have been officially arrested. All of them, 100%, none of them, not a single arrested case is directly linked with the 10 bomb blast of Bombay. All of them indirectly related to some other event. If you really catch the culprit, if you have proof, you have no objection. But at random picking up the Muslims, what signals are you sending? We know that about more than 300 innocent people were rounded up in Malwani. More than 300. For what? For interrogation. Any logical person will tell you that for interrogation, minimum, you at least require three or four policemen. If you want to do a proper interrogation, one policeman to threaten, one to have a soft approach, one to note down, maybe one to observe. At least three, if not four, minimum three, for a proper interrogation. It takes minimum one or two hours. People, experts say four or five hours. I say minimum at least one or two hours. How many interrogation can you do? What is the manpower of the Marwani police station? What is the manpower? How many can they do in a day? 10, 20, 30, 40? How many? How many? What is the manpower? What is the force? Maximum 100 if you let it go. They round up more than 300 people, keep them waiting for the full day, then they take the telephone number and address and leave them. What signals are you sending? It is my request that the police should take the Muslims in confidence. Recently, after the bomb blast, there was a program organized by the non-Muslims. How we have Muslims have here on terrorism. Similar, there was a program organized by the non-Muslims on similar topics. Topic was different, but the issue was the same. By the non-Muslims. And the organizers had invited two ex-senior police officials from Bombay. Ex. One of them comes and blames the Madrasa of Pakistan, the reason for terrorist attacks here. Second one comes and blames the Madrasas of India. In the speech you tell them, that they should have computers, English, no problem, I'm with you. But to say that the Indian madrasas are directly or indirectly, even remotely associated with any form of terrorism in India is nothing but a blatant lie. <laughs> Unfortunately for that police officer, there was one of the senior advocates in the audience. After the talk, he went and told him, that can you even give me a single white paper, single proof that any madrasa in India has been proven to be associated with any terrorist act? He said, I don't know. <laughs> Imagine what statement is the senior police officer giving to non-Muslims? What message are you sending? Hindus in turn will be against the madrasas. So making such irresponsible statements by senior police officers Say, I'm being careful, I'm not naming, why? Because I'm a responsible citizen. What signals are you sending? I don't know of any madrasa in India. See, they are the center of learning. Fine, we may disagree, we may want English there, we may want modernization. I speak with the people of madrasa, I may have differences, have more education, fine. Have English, have computers, we agree. But to say that they're involved in terrorist activities, indirectly or directly, even remotely, is nothing but a blatant lie. So what is happening? What message are you giving? We know that hundreds of innocent Muslims were detained. Many were arrested. The police goes and does a search in the house. Then they find some books on jihad. Proof. <laughs> Proof that involved in terrorist attacks. <laughs> the Bombay media reported that these same books are being sold in the bookstores of Muhammad Ali Road for several years. If that was the case, why weren't these bookstores closed down? Same books. Jihad. I would like to tell that do you know the Quran too speaks about Jihad. And almost all, every Muslim house has the Quran. Do you mean to say that you are going to arrest all the Muslims of Bombay? What signals are you sending? I, being a student of comparative religion, I would like to say that if you read the Mahabharat, there are more verses of killing in Mahabharat than the Quran. 
If you have a competition, Mahabharata has more verses of killing people than compared to the Quran. Bhagavad Gita is nothing but a guidance given by Sri Krishna to Arjun. Arjun says, how can I fight against my own cousins? If you read Bhagavad Gita chapter number 1 verse number 43, 44, 45, 46, he puts his arms on the battlefield and says, I would prefer dying unarmed rather than fight my cousins. Immediately, Bhagavad Gita chapter number 2 verse number 2, Sri Krishna, he says, Arjun, how could you be an impotent? And he continues, time doesn't permit me, you can see my videotape. It says that it is the duty of the Kshatriya to fight. When we see in context, I being a student of comparative religion, I agree with all the verses of fighting in Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata because I know the context. It's a fight between justice and injustice. It's a fight between truth and falsehood. And what Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata say that if you have to fight against falsehood, against injustice, even if it be your cousins, no problem, family members fight them. We are with it. That is what the Quran says. What my request is that even the police should know the religious teachings of the different citizens of India. And I always take opportunity and in the past several years I have spoken to several non-Muslim police officers, senior police officers in Bombay, in Bangalore, in various cities of India. I was even called a couple of years back to the National Police Academy in Hyderabad where I addressed more than 100 IPS officers, high ranking commissioners of police. DIG, IG, DG, the Director General of the National Academy was there. And when I spoke, they were shocked. Most of the information I gave, they were shocked. You should know what is the teaching of different religions. Imagine if I pick up these verses of the Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita and quote out of context, surely we can get rights here. We have to understand different religions. And by God's grace, Alhamdulillah, I have spoken to police and military internationally. In UK, in USA, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in UAE. Alhamdulillah. And I love interacting, especially with the non-Muslim police. Giving them the right picture of Islam. Unfortunately, they get the information of Islam from the international media. I come to the media in the ending. So what we should say, that we should have understanding. I've been told by several advocates and as Justice Suresh also said that hundreds of Muslims were picked up. They were detained. Some of them mentally tortured. Some of them physically tortured. The advocates told me that the clans, as Justice Suresh said, that they were tortured. Some of them were even made to sign on papers they didn't agree, even on blank papers. If you know who the culprits are, select a few, catch them if proven. If they have done it, they should be punished. We aren't against it. But to catch thousands of innocent Muslims, what signals are you sending? Imagine to catch 10 terrorists, you interrogate and harass a thousand innocent Muslims, irrespective whether you catch those 10 terrorists or not, surely you are making 100 new terrorists. <laughs> Many non-Muslim senior police officers in different parts, in different cities of India, and one particular in Bombay, he told me, Zakir Bhai, Dr. Zakir Naik, I will only be happy if you give talk in Hindi and Urdu. Your talk should be heard by the masses. I didn't speak. He said a couple of years back I started speaking. Many senior non-Muslim police officers in different parts of India, they tell me, they know that by God's grace, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 people come for my talks. And when I went to Kashmir, because I was the official guest, I met the minister, power minister, chief minister, but at that time the governor of Kashmir, Saxena, he wanted to meet me. My schedule was tight. Non-Muslim, I took out time. He wanted lunch, dinner, no time, I went for breakfast. Saxena, the governor of Kashmir, he happened to be an ex-military man. I forgot his post, some colonel or major or high post he was. And we discussed. He was caring for the people of Kashmir. Later on, he comes to Maharashtra, he comes to Bombay. He wants to meet me. He calls me to the Raj Bhavan, the governor's house. I go and meet there. He tells Dr. Zakir Naik, you know, the impact that you had in Kashmir, the people that follow you, we want you to come again. We want you to come on the television of Kashmir. We want to come on the radio. But what my question is, that do you think my talk will be effective? I know that there is not a single verse in the Quran which justifies 
the killing of innocent human beings. There is not a single saying, a hadith of the Prophet, that you can kill innocent human beings, even if they belong to the same community that does an injustice to you. I know that. I can speak. But imagine if thousands of innocent Muslims are being harassed. The police, they tell us, that most probably it's a hand of the L.E.T. Lakshay Toiba. For sake of argument, I agree with it. And the police tells us that the local hand should be involved, otherwise the bomb blast can't take place. I agree with it. Imagine the Lashkar Tohiba if they are involved, if you interrogate a thousand innocent human beings, they get ready-made recruits. Ready-made. You torture them, ready-made recruits. Isn't the police helping the Lashkar Tohiba? I'm sorry, please don't get me wrong. I don't want them to misunderstand me, otherwise they come to arrest me also. What signals are you sending? Imagine if I agree with you that your theory is correct, that Lashkar e Tohiba is involved and they want local hands, you should get the Muslims in confidence. You can't round up a thousand innocent Muslims. We know, we understand that getting the culprits is very difficult, especially because the bomb blast was done with precision, with accuracy. It was a mastermind, according to the police. We know it is difficult. We understand your case, but that doesn't mean in the name of interrogation you pick up a few innocent people, you can understand. But thousands, what message are you sending? Do you think my lecture will be effective? Maybe I will be able to convince 2, 3 percent, 5 percent, not more than that. So we have to solve the problem. What is the root problem? And the police should get the confidence of the citizens. If that is not there, how will they be able to stop terrorism? And if you want respect, you should give respect. There were good policemen also, many of my friends who are advocates and lawyers, they told me that there were good policemen who helped the people when they were harassed. Some of the policemen had a very good heart. They helped them, they supported them. But generally, oh, you have a beard. Why do you have a beard? Oh, you have towels above the ankle. Why do you keep it? Wearing a cap, as though it is mentioned in the rule book, a terrorist should have a beard, should have trousers above the ankle and a cap, then I would be number one terrorist. If you have my trousers above the ankle, I'm wearing a cap and I have a beard. What signals are you sending? There should be a proper training, a proper understanding of the religion of Islam. That's what William, when he advised, he told the US government that you don't know Islam. George Bush doesn't know Islam at all. It was an article that came yesterday in the midday. He doesn't know. Unless you don't understand, how will you be able to solve the problem? I don't want the police to misunderstand me. When I tell the Muslims that killing innocent people is wrong, though many Muslims they disagree with me, Quran condemns it. Our Prophet condemned it. Killing any innocent human being, you can't justify it. I have to speak the truth. At the same time, I even have to speak the truth to the police force. I hope they understand the situation. And according to Julio Ribeiro, he writes an article in Hindustan Times, I think it was the 9th of September. He says that more the unnecessary arrests that are made to get a breakthrough becomes more difficult proportionately. The more unnecessary people you arrest, the chances you get at the real culprit is more difficult. On the 2nd of September 2006, there was a good gesture by the police commissioner of Bombay, A. N. Roy. He wrote a personal letter to a couple of hundred Muslim leaders saying that the investigation is unbiased, we aren't harassing the Muslims. I too received one of these letters. And he said that if there is any query, any questions, we can come and sit across the table. We can talk. It's a good gesture. The letter came recently, just maybe a week back. I only hope it is not a theoretical exercise of public relations. If it's practically implemented that innocent Muslims should not be harassed. If you really want to get the confidence you see to it that you get the confidence of the Muslims. And then only you will be really able to catch the culprits. And if you get the culprits, whoever they are, surely they have to be punished. We know the authorities, they tell us, that why majority Muslims have been picked up. And the argument given was that when we analyze that in Punjab terrorism, majority people Arrested, they were sick. In Ulfa, in Assam, majority were Hindus. In Tamil Nadu LTT, they were Hindus. So, but natural in Bombay, 
because you know we think it's linked with Pakistan Kashmir, it would be Muslims. I agree with you for sake of argument. If a terrorist attack is done in Punjab, the majority of people living in Punjab are Sikh. So majority Sikhs are arrested, it is logical. In Assam, majority are Hindus, so Hindus are arrested, it is logical. In Tamil Nadu, majority people living are Hindus, so Hindus are arrested, logical. In Bombay, are the majority people living Muslims? The Muslims are minority. So why are they being picked up in majority? If you think it's an act of Kashmir militant, if you have got records, we have got no doubt with that. But do you mean to say the LTT can't come to Bombay? Do you mean to say Ulfa can't come to Bombay? Do you mean to say Sikh terrorists can't come to Bombay? You cannot say 100% this act has been Muslim. You can say high possibilities. And if you show proof, we are with you. What we are trying to tell you, that identify the people who are responsible, catch them and punish them. But not thousands of people, innocent Muslims being rounded up. We know there are several records. Just a couple of months back, according to the ATS of Maharashtra, 16 members were arrested from a hardcore Hindu organization. They were involved in three bomb blasts in mosques. Mahmudi Mosque in Parbani, one of the mosques in Jalna, one in Purna, three. And recently on 6th of April, in one place, by mistake, a bomb detonates, by mistake. While they were making a bomb, it exploded. It killed four people and 11 were injured. When inquiries were made, many people belonged to the same hardcore Hindu organization. And they found there that the plan was that to attack the mosque in the guise of Sikh. You know, this took place in Nandit. Sikh, why? Because there was a rift going on between the Muslims and Sikh. A Sikh girl married a Muslim boy. So there was tension. So they wanted to get advantage. So they wanted to do an act in the guise of Sikh. There are cases we know that Hindus have attacked wearing caps and beards. So you can't say 100% Muslims are involved. Maybe high possibilities. I'm not saying no. Recently, a few days back, on Friday, 8th of September, four bomb blasts took place in Malika. One outside one of the mosques, one outside a graveyard, in which 35 innocent Muslims were killed and more than 100 innocent Muslims were injured. Again, prime suspect, LAT. Can be, but not prime. Imagine, it is a game plan. It's a no name game. If you go to America, it's Al Qaeda. Here it is LAT. According to an article that came in the DNA on the 6th of September, a person by the name of Joseph, he writes that the foreign experts they tell that if you involve yourself too much in the blame game, you lose focus and the main culprits are never caught. You do a proper investigation. If really they are caught, they have to be punished. Irrespective whether the terrorists are Muslims or non-Muslims, whether they belong to Kashmir, whether to Pakistan, whether Ulfa, whether LTT, if they are proved to be involved in that, they should be punished. I am not here to support any terrorist act, not at all. But if you want to get to the bottom of it, you should know that this should be done meticulously. You should take the citizens in confidence. One of the other cause is the media. Mainly that media which is controlled by the politicians. We have to be careful of this. And this media, they can convert black to white, day to night, hero into a villain, villain into hero. And we see that very often. If you see my tapes, I've given very such examples. But in India, it's fortunate that the more popular media is not controlled by the politicians. And we find that this media really gave the true picture, whether it be the Gujarat rights, the Bombay rights in 93, or even today, the innocent Muslims are being harassed. The media, whether it be the newspaper, the news channels, they have really given a true picture of what's happening. Not 100 percent. Sometimes they get involved in news which is sensational. So when they get the news without checking up, they give it. It's sensational, they give it. But as a whole, we have to agree, the media has been honest. I'm talking about non-Muslim media. I'm not talking about the Muslim media. And here we find that they were honest and they projected the real picture. But what we have to be careful is of the media which is controlled by the politicians. And as far as the judiciary system is concerned in India, the innocent citizen of India, 
especially the Muslim victims. We have faith in the Indian judiciary system. Though some people say that some are corrupt, they are blasphemed in the community, but as a whole, we know most of the judges, they are upright and they are honest. We only hope that these people are not influenced by the politicians. So far I know most of the judges, they don't care much for the politicians. If once the politicians get hold of the judicial system, then God save this country. Yet, we have faith in the judiciary system. And to conclude, we have to realize that since we know that the cause of terrorism is injustice, the cause of terrorism is wrongdoing to a particular group of people, this thing should be stopped. How can we stop? As I mentioned, number one, the politicians, they should be honest, they should be just. They should not go for the vote bank and do things which are wrong. Once they are honest and they are just, irrespective they lose their seat, you see to it that terrorism will stop. Point number two, the innocent Indian citizens, they should not be instigated by the politicians and do wrong things and kill other innocent human beings. Point number three, the police, they should be upright. They should be just. If someone is being harmed, they should see to it that he's protected. They should not be ploy of the politicians. I know there are times that they can be transferred, but if every policeman in India is honest, the new policeman who stands for will also be honest. So what will the politician do? If 100% of the policemen, I'm not blaming all of them, please don't get me wrong. I know most of them honest, they want to do, but because they're under the pressure of the politicians, they're afraid that they'll be transferred, they'll be harassed. But if all the policemen get together and say, let's all of us be honest, if they transfer you, the new person coming will also be honest. So there itself, most of this trouble of injustice will stop. And last but not the least, people cannot take the law in their hand. They cannot kill other innocent human beings even if they belong to the same community who has an injustice on you. If we take this and we see to it that injustice is stopped, then surely India will be a very good country. It is estimated that in the next, by 2020, India would be a superpower. If all the Hindus and Muslims, if we live together, if we love each other harmoniously, we may have our differences. The differences will be there. We live with our differences. But we love each other and we live peacefully and harmoniously. Again, India will be a superpower. And Mahatma Gandhi, he said that if India has to improve, it should be ruled by a dictator as honest and as upright as Hazrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. Mahatma Gandhi, the father of a nation, he advised the best thing India can do is have a dictator like Hazrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him, Radhi Anhu. He was an honest person. When it came for justice, he did not see whether the Muslim or non-Muslim. For justice, he gave justice. Therefore, he got the title Al Farooq, the person who differentiated truth from falsehood. I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17. Verse number 81, which says, Wakul jal haq mazakal batil, in the labatil akana zahuka. When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson, who said that people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Wa akhir dawana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Jazakallah, thank you for your appreciation of the talk. We wonder how awesome and corrective would be the question and answer session. We start the question and answer session quickly. May I point the rules? Your question should be on the topic. It should be brief and to the point, and only one question at a time may be asked. Five microphones have been provided in the auditorium, one on my left for the gents, one on my right for the gents, one in the rear for the ladies, on the first floor balcony, one more microphone, number four, for the gents. Those who would like to ask questions are kindly requested to line at one of the mics to put forward your question. Yes, the brother here can put forward his question. Microphone number two. Yes, brother. We will request you to ask quickly and briefly so we can cover more in the less time we have. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Muhammad Arafat. I am a student. You said in your talk, two wrongs does not make a right. A few months... We'll allow non-Muslim the first preference, please. So any non-Muslim in the queue, they're most welcome. 
It's always a policy in our organization that we give first preference to our guest. If they non-Muslim like to ask a question, they're most welcome. Any non-Muslim, with the brothers and sisters, they're most welcome. The time is limited. So any non-Muslim would like to ask a question, they would be given the first chance. Any non-Muslim, yes, brother, most welcome. My name is Shyam. Shyam Sunar. I work in the Mahanagar paper in Marathi. I'm a teacher. I mean, I don't have a word for you. What do I say? But I think that in India, there is a word for Hindu and Muslim. कुछ ना कुछ होना चाहिए ऐसा मुझे लगता है मैं करता आया हूँ दस बारह साल से लेकिन आपके मुंह से मैं ये सुनना चाहता हूँ कि भारत में बस्ती में मैं तो चालीस गांव इस गांव में रहता था मुंबई में रजुरेटी के लिए आया हूँ बस्ती बस्ती में जो हिंदू और मुस्लिम हैं इनके दिल में अगर गलत फहमी है और वो है भी सही मायने में कुछ हद तक है तो वो दूर करने के लिए आपकी क्या सुझाव है कि हिंदू और मुस्लिम दोनों कम्युनिटी के लोग कैसे इकट्ठे आ सकते हैं Brother asked a very good question that what is the suggestion from me that how can we get the Hindus and Muslims on a common platform, how can we come together? The reply to this is, I have given a talk on similarities between Hinduism and Islam. I have given that talk in Bombay, I have given the talk in Chennai, I have given in other parts of India and we find there that tens of thousands have attended in Bombay about 20,000, in Chennai a similar number and other parts of India and many non-Muslims have attended many Hindus have attended thousands of them and many of them told me that brother Zakir there was a person just a comment that what I did not know about Hinduism in the past 40 years of my life I have learned in the past 4 hours I follow the guidance of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64 which says Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa imbarna bainakum Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na with the illallah. That we worship none but one God. What we realize that I don't believe in interfaith dialogue. We say that Hinduism is the same, Islam is the same, Christianity is the same. This is just a gimmick. If I ask the Hindu Pandit, will you become a Muslim? He'll say no. If I ask the Muslim, will you become a Christian? He'll say no. If I ask the priest, will you become a Hindu? He'll say no. So what is same? It's not same. We have to agree that there are differences, but there are similarities also. Let us agree at least to follow the commonalities. What is different, keep it aside. So what I say, that take all the religious scriptures, whether it be the Bhagavad Gita, whether it be the Veda, the Upanishad, the Bible, the Quran, at least what is common, what is different, keep it aside, we can discuss some other time, but at least what is common, let us agree to follow it. And I've given a talk and I've showed so many similarities, so many, so you can refer to my video cassette, and what happens, many of them are not aware, the Muslims are not aware of their religion, similarly the Hindus are not aware of their religion. Many of the Muslims objected, similarity between Islam and Hindu is impossible. So many of the people came with the talk to attack. Now Rabbi, I'm bullying, what nonsense. Hindu and Muslim, same. Hoi ni takta hai. But when they heard the talk, they were shocked. Those who came to attack, they agreed with the talk. Similarly, many Hindus came. So what we realize that what is common we should follow. And number one is Allah na abudha illa. That we worship none but one God. That's the most common thing. And which you can give quotations. And we can give quotations from the Vedas, from the Bhagavad Gita. It is mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad. Chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ekkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Shvetashitar Upanishad. Chapter number six, verse number nine. Nacha se kasij, janita na chadipa. Of him, there are no lord. He has got no parents. These are Sanskrit quotations. That means Almighty God has got no parents. He has got no lord. Furthermore, if we analyze, it is mentioned in the Svetasara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, Natasti Pratimasti, of that God, there are no images. There is no Pratima, there is no photograph, there is no idol, there is no image. Same thing in Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Natasti Pratimasti, of that God, there are no images. So if you go back to your Vedas and your religious scriptures, it speaks about one God. So people many a times are not aware of the scriptures. And when the question just a couple of days back, I had given an interview to Star News. They asked me, Brother Zakir, what is your view regarding Mandi Mataram? Can the Muslims say or not? I said, what do the Muslims say? I'll come to it afterwards. I'll first tell you what the Hindu scriptures say. <laughs> he was shocked. What do I mean by that? I said, if anyone was a scholar of the Veda, the Veda agrees that God has got no Pratima. So when you say Vande Mataram, that this 
country is my mother and you call it God. A person who's a scholar, I'm not talking about the normal people who don't know about the scriptures. But you ask a scholar, he will say that Vande Matram goes against the Vedas. Because Vande Matram in no less than three places it says, I bow down to thee. I worship thee. If you see about the Arya Samaj and you see the various top scholars, they think that according to the Vedas, idol worship is not permitted. There are verses in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20, which says that you should not do idol worship. So here when we go back to our scriptures, unfortunately, they believe in a form of pantheism. So even according to the Vedas, if you're a good scholar, this song, Mande Mataram, that I bow down and I worship thee, as I quoted in Sanskrit, about Upanishad, it's against. Even in Islam, there are 12 lines which are objectionable. Three times it is said, Mande Mataram, which means I bow down to thee. Once it says that this country is my mother, once it says I will kiss the feet, once it says about the divine things, about the smile, talking about divinity, it calls it Lakshmi, it is called Durga, all these things are objectionable. We Muslims, we love this country, but we will not bow down to anyone but to Almighty God. Even a mother, even a mother who has born in a womb for nine months, we love her, we respect her, but we will not bow down to our mother. To our own mother. The number one human being who we love and respect in the world after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will even not bow down to a prophet, prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Is it required that we should sing this song, Mande Mataram? It is a political gimmick. Politicians, they thought they get the vote bank. They even made a gimmick on the date. You know when it was written by Bankin Chand Chattopadhyay in 1876. It was published in 1882. So where is century come now? And where is 7 September? They made a mistake, the politician, political gimmick. <laughs> Furthermore, even a Muslim living in Saudi Arabia, he cannot bow down to his country, Saudi Arabia. Even a Muslim living in Pakistan cannot bow down to Pakistan. It is shirk. So to say that the Indian Muslims are not patriotic, it is our religion. Our creator, our God who has made this country is far superior. So we love this country when required for the truth, we are willing to die for this country. But we will not bow down to anyone but Almighty God. We would prefer questions from non-Muslims first because we have a limited time. I think it would be fair to the occasion. And people who would like to ask questions on slip can kindly write on the slips and pass it on down the aisle. Yes. Any other question with any sister there? A non-Muslim sister? Yes. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to everyone present here. My name is Preeti Sethi. I would like to ask you, sir, as in your talk you have said that Osama Biladin, we can't consider him as a terrorist, as it is said in BBC and CNN channels. But at the same time, we get the same information about the bomb blast and the count which we get about the bomb blast on the same channel. So whether it has to be believed or no. Thank you, sir. The sisters asked a very good question, very relevant question. I said that when we talk about Osama bin Laden, that if you get information on BBC that he's a terrorist, we don't have to believe. But when we get the count of the bomb blast, do we have to believe? That's what I said, the people controlling. That doesn't mean all the news of BBC is wrong. That news in which they make a hero into a villain, in which they'll benefit, you have to check up. So here when we see that these normally bomb blast figures that you get, most of them, that you find will be somewhat similar. If it's a government channel of the country in which the bomb blasts are taking place, the figure will be normally no. Why? Because the government wants to show that less people have been killed. Like the police commissioner wrote to me, 187 people killed. Newspaper writes 207. I don't know who's right. I'm not saying that Commissioner A. Roy is lying. I'm not saying that. Please don't get me wrong. So here we have to realize when we get information, we have to see the proof. When we see the proof, about Osama bin Laden, even on the channel, it is mentioned prime suspect, sister. Prime suspect. Prime suspect. Do you know, if you go to the website of the US Department of Justice, Info Police, they give the list of the terrorist organizations. Terrorist organizations. 43, 60% are Muslim. Can you guess? Which is the most popular terrorist organization? Can you guess Muslim terrorist organization? Can you guess? No, sorry. Which is the most popular... Muslim terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda. Al you don't get a prize for that, very easy. <laughs> Al-Qaeda. According to the US Department, you know how many attacks? How many attacks? Ulfa, 749 attacks. Al-Qaeda, only 28. Out of that, 26 alleged, 2 
Who Al Qaeda claims they did it? According to the site of U.S. Department of Justice, Al Qaeda claims all alleged, not a single proved. Even on the official site of U.S. Department of Justice, not a single attack of Al Qaeda has been proved. I am not here to support Al Qaeda. You know when Yohan Redley went to Afghanistan, she was arrested by the Taliban. She comes back and she asks the question, "What are views about Al Qaeda?" She replies, "I doubt whether Al Qaeda exists." <laughs> So sister, what I'm trying to tell you that when we get the information, if you are a man of the media or a person of the media, you can realize and you know that this information mostly will be correct. This has to be checked up. So what we have to realize that it is suspect, prime suspect, prime suspect. Even on CNN and BBC, even though they say it's a prime suspect, they're treating him as though he's a culprit. Can you go and kill thousands of Afghans only because of prime suspect? Not even proved. So, but natural sister, when we hear the news, we have to realize that who controls the news, what is the agenda behind, and then we have to be careful what news you take and what you quote. Hope that answers the question, sister. A non-Muslim brother. Uh, the question has been put forward by my non-Muslim friend. Okay, we'll allow that. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Myself, Saif, and I am a management student. Uh, the question is that, uh, do you think that uh, Muslim uh, feel insecurity, and that's why can we say that the terrorism is its outcome? Thank you, sir. Your comment, please. You will ask the question that do Muslims feel insecure and that is the reason terrorist acts are done. I told in my talk the main root cause of terrorism is injustice. It's not insecurity. Insecurity may be part of it but the main cause is injustice. Injustice and something wrong done to a group of people. If you read an article that came yesterday on Sunday midday on the eve of the 9-11 one of the very famous persons name is William he writes and he gives advice that the root cause is injustice and wrong done to community. And he agrees with the Bombay authorities that there are possibilities that Kashmiris may have done bomb blasts in Bombay. But he says, what is the cause? According to him, the Kashmiris are unmilitant people. They are peace-loving people. So what has forced them to fight? And he gives his view, it is because of democracy which is forged. He says that, not me. Eh? It's not my comments. Person is an expert and he gives advice to people in the world. He says that the democracy is forged. It is manipulated. That's the reason what we find that they're fighting. Same in Palestine. They're fighting because the rights are taken away. So the main cause of terrorism is injustice done to a group or any wrong done. So to get their rights back, this gives rise to a fight, to a retaliation, which is called terrorism by people opposing it. Those who agree with they call good. For example, Bhagat Singh, he fought for the freedom of the country. By the British, he was called terrorist. We call him freedom fighter. So depending upon what is the background, therefore, before you give a label of terrorist, therefore I said terrorism has got different meanings, has got different definitions. It changes because of geographical definition. It changes because of history. So the same person who's called a terrorist by British government, we Indians called him a freedom fighter. So like that, we have to find out the main cause is injustice done to a group of people. I'll ask a question from non-Muslim brother on the slip. It's Christopher Lobo asks, how can you prove that 9-11 was an inside job? Brother Lobo has asked that how can I prove 9-11 was an inside job? I've got the proofs. I can repeat the proof. It has been proven by other people. Just a few days back, there was an article that came in the newspaper that 75 professors of US, they say, they believe that 9-11 was an inside job. And in the article, it was mentioned, it came in Times of India, I think on the 7th of September. It says that 75 professors and scientists belonging to different universities from different parts of US, they believe that 9-11 was inside job. And they say that there were some politicians in White House who have engineered the destruction of the Twin Towers. And they say the main reason was so that they could attack and they could have control of the all rich countries. Open secret, I told you. One of the professors by the name of Steve Joan, he says that we do not believe that 19 hijackers and a few men in the cave in Afghanistan could have done such a professional job alone. They could not have done it. 
we don't believe and by god we are going to come to the truth and we are going to expose we don't believe in the theory of the government they don't believe in the theory of the government and he further goes on to say that we as being professors and scientists we know that the steel beam of the twin towers they couldn't have melted at the temperature at which the jet fuel was there and there was systematic bomb explosions which caused this to come down otherwise it cannot come down there are many tips there are many books written against it i happen to watch many of them i even happen to watch the video recording of this professor steve jones and yesterday's paper we got another news 3 days later professor steve jones sent on a paid leave <laughs> imagine paid leave there are many tips if you happen to watch one of the tapes by the name of loose change 911 it was done by a young american of 21 years old he makes a one hour documentary there are many many are there this 911 documentary it has collected clips from the various of cnn or fox channel all the news clipping he took interviews etc and made a one hour documentary and then he says that people who saw the airplane they said it cannot be a passenger carrier it looked like a military plane it didn't have any windows and when he shows the shooting when it comes close to the tower there is another firing done from the wings which hits the twin tower before the plane then further he goes on to prove he says that he had statements of the management the construction company which had constructed the twin towers they said it's impossible the twin tower made to withstand storm to withstand tornado this plane cannot knock it down and it cannot come down because the fuel burns at 1000 degrees temperature this even for 2000 degrees temperature for us nothing will happen to it 10 years later he changes his statement and said no it's possible jet fuel can cause damage to the beams another professor who gave the statement he didn't withdraw his statement back so he was sacked <laughs> furthermore what they did that in the documentary they show that when the twin towers came down like how you willfully get down any building and he gave statistics that many buildings in new york tall skyscrapers 40 floor 60 floor they caught fire for many hours but none of them came down it is the first building in the history of usa it has come down that way and he showed photograph that when building it deliberately brought down how do they get down by the explosion the same way it came down there was systematic bomb blast and people who went to rescue whether it be the firemen they were interviewed they said that we were thinking that someone up was pressing the bomb button and the bombs were going out boom 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 so how the twin tower come down they have given proof furthermore they say that all the proof given by the government they analyzed they said 19 hijackers some of them they were trained as flying of the plane they went to the university and they interviewed the professor do you think that this person can do such an act impossible the way the plane took a turn and i have personally spoken to senior pilots who have flown big boeings and airbuses for several years they said it's impossible to take such a turn and imagine just a new person of few hundred of our takes a turn what the experts say it has to be a military plane furthermore information given by the government you know phone calls were there phone calls phone call said that they said the passenger in the plane they claimed that they were hijacked one of the phone calls was by a flight attendant she says that buildings water my god my god she is being flying for 12 years have been in buildings in new york another person he says mom this is mark bingham mom can you hear me we are being hijacked do you believe the question to be asked if i am going to speak to my mom I will say Zakir. I'll not say I'm Zakir. Next speaking, he said I'm Mark Bingham. Mom, I'm Mark Bingham. If Mark has to speak to the mom, he will say I'm Mark. He will not say I'm Mark Bingham. He gave systematic proofs. Do you speak to your mother telling your surname? So all the proofs, all the phones were taped down, and then he did a survey that can the mobile phone work at 32,000 feet? When a survey was done at 4,000 feet, the chances of mobile working is 0.4 percent. At 8,000 feet, it is. 0.1 percent and 32,000 feet. It is 0.006 percent. 0.006. There's no chance. And the documentary says that today USA is spending millions of dollars to reach mobile at that height. In 2001, they did it. <laughs> Then.
there are many documentaries. Then the documentary says that there are black boxes. Every plane has got two black boxes. And the black boxes can withstand a temperature of 3000 degrees centigrade for several hours. And in just 1000 or 2000 degrees, all the black boxes have been destroyed. He goes on systematically. And immediately, after a couple of weeks, Osama bin Laden, he gives an interview on the Ummah magazine. And he says that I am a Muslim, I will not lie. According to me, killing innocent women is prohibited, it is wrong. Killing innocent children is wrong. Killing any innocent human being is wrong and Islam condemns it. Osama bin Laden giving an interview and saying that. A couple of days back you get a video clipping from Al Jazeera. Osama bin Laden training 9-11. Because 75 professors say it and inside job, now they manipulate and after five years they're showing on the television. Why? So here we realize everything, it was inside job. And these 75 professors, they have promised, by God, we will come to the bottom of it. Regarding the second attack at Pentagon. At Pentagon, when the airplane crashed, there was no scraping on the grass. Nothing. Only a hole in the Pentagon. And the hole was only equal to the body of the plane. And we see a crater and they showed on the television, but when the wings went, the wings weren't seen outside, neither were the window panes damaged of the Pentagon. If a plane body goes in and the wing stays out, either the wing will remain outside or the window pane will damage. The building was intact. So how could only in the circumference of a body of a plane, how can the wings go in as well as the tail? We be fabricated. The people who said that, you know, the plane went just 40 feet above my head. Today science tells us that if Boeing is flying at 40 feet above head, that car will fly away. <laughs> An interview was taken of ex-military person, he said, it sounded like a missile. It had to be a missile. The missile would make that hole. And there was no debris, there was debris, only a little bit debris. There was no part of the plane found there. There was only a small engine of a fighter plane found there. Even in the other place, they only find a crater. Time doesn't permit me. The amount of ample of evidence given there, even a fool will know that this was an inside job. But it doesn't convince George Bush. And what they say, the reason is only to attack Afghanistan, Iraq, and then Iran. They have been predicting that Iran is going to be attacked. They want to have control of the oil rich countries. So this terrorist attack is for what? One is injustice. Second is for money, it's for power. And many politicians find that he's going to lose the vote, he creates a fear psychosis. Okay, you better elect me or the Muslims will get you and they elected. Same thing in Gujarat. A fear psychosis was created. If you don't elect us, the Muslims will kill you and the government came back in power. So what we realized that this was nothing but an inside job. And there are several tips, and several VCDs available. 9-11, loose change, then Fahrenheit, many. And if you see all this, it is a blatant open secret that this attack on the Twin Towers was done by George Bush himself. The, the last question of the day. So my question is very, very, very much basic to you. Uh, I believe that, uh, as you said, terrorism is a fight against injustice, right? I also believe that terrorism is somehow a fight against the government of by a common people. किसी इंसान के साथ अगर अन्याय होता है तभी वो जाके मजहब के नाम पे लोग इकट्ठा करता है और फिर यू नो ही ट्राइज टू फाइट अगेंस्ट व्हाट एवर इज हैपन टू हिम बट व्हाट आई बिलीव इज एक इंसान एक नॉर्मल पर्सन यू नो इफ समबडी हम में से अगर कोई गुजरात में होता तो शायद हम भी वही करते जो उन्होंने किया मतलब और आप क्या कर सकते हैं आप पुलिस पे आपको भरोसा नहीं है जुडिशियल सिस्टम दस साल लगा देगी तो एक नॉर्मल इंसान के पास कौन सा ऑप्शन बचता है अगर उसके साथ कुछ बुराई हो तो वट वुड यूर एडवाइस बी टू अमल मैन लाइक मी इफ समिंग लाइक दिस हैपन्स टू मी वट शुड वी डू आई एग्री विथ यू What you are saying is that if it happened with you or me, when we see our family members being killed in front of us, our mothers and our sisters being raped, our houses being what will you do? And I agree that what you do the same thing. A normal human being will do that. That's normal unless we have so much faith in Almighty God. I do agree with you. 99% human beings, unless he's wearing bangles. Otherwise, this is a normal reaction unless a person has faith in Almighty God. Even I would want to do the same if I did not know my Quran. If I did not know from the Quran, it is wrong. Because if I kill an innocent human being, I am behaving like the same person who caused problem injustice to me. Just because someone does injustice to me, it does not justify me to kill other innocent human being. 
Just because somebody has robbed me, I can't go and rob a third person. If I catch that person responsible and book him and punish him, that's a different case. But I cannot kill any innocent human being based on the logic of the Quran that it prohibits you from killing any innocent human being. I, because I know the Quran, I will not retire it in that way. I will try and get evidence. I will try and convince the government. If he goes scot free, what I say? That all those people responsible for these terrorist acts, whether done in Gujarat, in Bombay, right? whether the politicians, whether the police, whether people have killed, whether the people who did the bomb blast, even if they go scot free in this world, on the day of judgment, God will surely punish them. So we as Muslims believe, as it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 185, that every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense on the day of judgment, because we believe this life is the test for the year after, we leave it. If we cannot do something here, we leave it for Almighty God to do the justice. And inshallah, he'll be punished in the year after. If we catch Hitler today, what punishment can you give him? Six million people answer, what punishment can you give him? You can kill him once. What about the remaining five million, nine lakhs, ninety-nine thousand, nine ninety-nine people? Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number fifty-six, that those who reject our signs, we shall put them in the hell fires. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. Today, science tells us that there are pain receptors. So God tells that on the day of judgment, if the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. If God wants to incinerate. Hitler, six million times you can do it, we can't do it here. So therefore we leave it to the main justice, main justice to God. We thank you all for being present here. We would have loved to put forward all your questions. Dr. Zakir would have not minded. There were questions like Islam was spread at the point of the sword, jihad and terrorism and many others. Inshallah, at a future date, we would get to hear more from Dr. Zakir. Jazakallah khairan. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this program possible for all of us present here today. And we thank all our guests to have heard the program with so much interest and enthusiasm. Thank you very much. And I would lastly like to thank all the technical people and the people who have been recording this program for many, many millions more to hear it all over the world. Thank you. Jadakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Damr Halida otvorili su dušu i srce. Saznajte sve o gorčini lutanja životom bez vjere, te o radostima povratka na pravi put kroz istinite priče, ispovijesti mladih širom svijeta. Kako spoznati životni cilj i učiniti prekretnicu u svom životu, odgovor ćete naći u iskrenim i dirljivim kazivanjima koja će vas dovesti do suza. Neka njihova uputa bude i tvoja. Otvorili su dušu i srce. Ljudi sanjaju. Snovi su stvarnost koja nas prati do smrti. Neki snovi upućuju, neki upozoravaju, neki donose radosnu vijest, a neki su produkt razmišljanja ili šeitanovog djelovanja. Potražite i provjerite svoje snove u knjizi koja je objasnila preko 3000 pojmova koji se u snovima javljaju. Prvi stanovnik pisan peron Bošnjaka, doktora Šefika Kurdića, nastao na najpoznatijim izvorima, utemeljenim na poslanikovoj tradiciji. Spavajte mirno i tumačite svoje snove sanovnikom doktora Šefika Kurdića. Muzika